Have you ever wondered how you could be making six or seven figures in your business, yet you feel like you never have enough money? Does the mere idea of tackling your business finances make you break out into an anxious sweat? My latest offering, the CFO Money Method Membership Program, is designed to take your attention off the sales numbers and see what's going on inside of your business. This program has helped many business owners get out of debt, manage their finances, and make tons of money in their business. My friend Cindy found that creating a plan for her business and monitoring her progress against that plan every month helped her shape her business into a money-making machine. And she let go of the anxiety around managing her money just by following this four-step program. This program will be open for registration from January 19th to January 26th of 2021. If this sounds like a program that you want to learn more about, head on over to my website at melissahoustoncpa.com and sign up for a free 15-minute discovery call to find out if this offer is the right fit for you. That's melissahoustoncpa.com and I'll see you there. Welcome to the Think Like a CFO podcast, where we dig into not only what it takes to start a business, but to keep your business thriving for years to come using my signature CFO money method framework. I'm your host, Melissa Houston, and I am a CPA and business financial coach. I have over 20 years of experience in business, and it is my passion to share my knowledge of business finance and personal finance with other women. You can also follow me with my column at Forbes.com or my column with Entrepreneur.com. Aspiring writer and realtor Vivian Sharon launched her new book, The Boomer Seven Step Guide to Downsizing, Overcoming Fear and Discovering Freedom. In this book, Vivian shares the key strategies and methods that have helped so many of her boomers and senior clients overcome their fear of downsizing so that they can transition to a joyful life. From assisting young urban professionals and couples investing in their first condo to helping boomers plan their new lifestyle change, Vivian takes pride in the relationships formed with her clients. She helps empty nesters, who are 55 plus, find solutions when they are ready to sell their large suburban home in Toronto and the GTA and transition to a more urban, chic lifestyle. She recognizes that in today's COVID environment, boomers and seniors may have shifted their priorities, and she is here to help. You can find Vivian at viviansharon.com. Hi, Vivian. I am so happy to welcome you to the Think Like a CFO podcast. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's super exciting. I am talking with Vivian today about real estate. And I personally love this topic because real estate can be such a fantastic investment. But for the majority of us, we also it's our largest purchase that we ever make in our life if we're going into real estate of like home ownership, or if you're looking at property rentals, or looking for your parents, if they're boomers and they're downsizing, this is going to be the show for you to listen to. So Vivian, I would love for you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Absolutely. So my name is Vivian Sharon. I'm a real estate broker centered in Toronto, based out of Yorkville, Central Midtown Toronto. And I help people who are thinking of buying their first condo, young families, young professionals upsizing to a larger home due to having children, growing family. And I would say 50% of my business today has evolved to the boomer plus senior market, which is 55 years old and plus and older. Very, very big, important demographic today in Toronto, Ontario, and in Canada. It's such an important demographic that you actually wrote a book on it. Would you love to, I'd love to hear more details about your book. I've read it, but I'd love for every listener to hear about it as well. It's a fantastic book. Thank you so much, Melissa. Well, I was really inspired during this year, lockdown year of COVID to sit back and think, what can I do to help people who are just like myself? They're 55 plus. They have children who have grown. Most of them have large homes in central, midtown, Toronto, suburbia, north Toronto, GTA, 
anywhere in Toronto, in the province or in Canada. And I'm thinking I can relate to them because I've been through this experience too. And I realize that boomers who have been living in their family home 20, 30, 40 years, that they have outgrown their home. And perhaps a lot of them are thinking of making changes. And I wanted to take the fear out of the fear factor of change, which I find is huge for this older demographic. Absolutely. I'd love to hear more about that because I can totally relate. My parents are definitely of the boomer age and they live in a very large home in the suburbs. And I worry that they're getting older and it's going to be harder to maintain, but they want nothing to do with this conversation. And I feel as though it could be very much fear-based. So I'd love to hear your opinion on this. I will tell you that this is very, very true. In conversations with boomers and their older uh, adult parents, they really are fearful of change. I think it has to do with age. Certainly, it just is the way, uh, that's the way it is. And when one is fearful, the main fear and the scary factor I have found is where to begin. These people, meaning myself and others who are 55, 60, 65 plus plus, they haven't moved in so long. They haven't perhaps and likely bought or sold real estate for such a long time, so many decades, they don't know where to begin. So they are paralyzed. So what my book has done, I wanted to explain to people, you shouldn't be fearful. I'm here to help you overcome your fear and discover freedom. The topic and the title of the book is The Boomer's Seven-Step Guide to Downsizing, Overcoming Fear, and Discovering Freedom. And that is the goal. My goal is to sit down with the entire family, several generations if that is necessary, and to discuss what is holding you back. Let's have a conversation. How can I help you? How would you benefit from a move if that is something you are considering? And what does what do your next 20 plus years look like? Once we have this conversation, they will usually tell me they're most fearful of getting their home ready for sale. What do they need to do? And that's where the conversation begins. Because it is an overwhelming process. Absolutely overwhelming. The first thing I will do is reach out to them. I will say, are you the only decision makers or are your adult children involved? I would like to include your adult children if you wish, or if not, we can just sit down and have a conversation together. And number one, I always find out is the decluttering aspect. They Most people have their basements or the hot spot of decluttering and even hoarding. And I've seen so many scenarios like that. Basement, that's where everything goes. The toys when the kids were like two and now they're 40 and their clothes and all the office paraphernalia, so much and extra, every kind of clutter you can imagine. So I do cover making the decision once the decision is made, how I can bring in my team of experts to help alleviate your fear. And we have a strategy. And in this book, I go chapter by chapter to develop the strategy to help alleviate their fear. And then we proceed with the paperwork. Again, they haven't done paperwork for a long time. So I explained to them how the transaction process works. And the third thing is, how do we get your home ready for sale? Now, that's what I loved about your book is because it really outlines the process. So when I read through it, you know, keeping my parents in mind, I had a really good idea of what to expect. You helped me consider things that I hadn't really considered before. And for those listeners who are interested in getting your copy of the book, we will leave the link in the show notes so you can enjoy listening to the podcast and then you can go get the link for the book in the notes. You lay out everything so well and really give the reader a thorough understanding of what to expect when it's time to downsize. Because as you mentioned, you know, these are people who have been in their homes for 30, 40, 50 years. So that's a lot of history in that house. Absolutely. That's very true. So what I do is because I'm a specialist and I have taken advanced training in the boomer senior market, which, and I represent only one out of a group of 30 across Canada, only 30 real estate professionals across Canada have this advanced training, which I do offer. It's very helpful because I have a network of specialists that can help, that can provide every aspect of the real estate process. I'm not just concerned in my role to get the home sold and to do the transaction and complete it 
And I am here for the emotional piece. I to hold their hand, to walk them to the transitional process. If they need transitional specialists, declutterers, movers, stagers, financial planners, mortgage brokers, lawyers, and they haven't got a team together, I offer that to them as a free service that they can use and call upon. So my number one thing is once the decision is made to sell and downsize, the conversation is how to select the right realtor. So I discuss in the book, what are the criteria? Of course, I offer specialty training. However, I give them the ABCs of the questions you should ask to select your realtor. And then we discuss preparing your home for sale. That's where we discuss doing a little bit of updating and certainly having your home look showable and very, very much to to be in the buyer's eyes to look really nice. And what I recommend is usually do a little bit of painting, make sure that everything is tidy for any kind of showings to make sure that there's updated. Let's say if there's old broadloom in the house, we'll go through the home and we'll say, listen, I would recommend perhaps we remove this broadloom and we put in some hardwood floor. If that's too expensive, certainly engineered or laminate. We do a neutral painting the entire home if that is affordable to you. And we go through the ABCs of preparing your home for sale after you have decluttered and having all the personal pictures and picture frames and clutter removed. I hate to say it, but it is important. So the house looks very, very showable to those buyers who come with the view that they want to imagine living in their home. So I discussed that, the essentials of preparing your home for sale. That's another aspect. And then we can discuss staging, which is extremely important. I would love to hear about staging. So the question is to stage or not to stage. And it has been proven that staging on average brings 10 to 20% more value upon the sale net in your pocket because people cannot visualize what a home looks like if it is filled with clutter or if it is vacant, either scenario. So I would come in with my stagers of which I use several and I would recommend an interview with the owner to interview one or two stagers just to get another viewpoint of what they suggest and price point. And what they will do is probably suggest in many cases, remove some of the furniture in the house, remove all, remove some, or if the house is vacant, certainly the main rooms, the main floors, the bedrooms, the basement, not always necessary to spend the money. However, it's extremely important today. Buyers are so sophisticated. They look at magazines and watch HDTV and they want to move in ready. Uh, They want to move in ready house because it's a hassle to do a renovation. Millennials and, and generation Xers do not have the time, money or interest in most cases to do a reno. So then what would you suggest to an older couple who's been in their house for years? They probably haven't done any updates. If you're looking at original cabinetry and flooring and the house is outdated, but they don't want to spend some money on updating it, what would you recommend in that situation? I will tell you what I would recommend. I would suggest a mild type of update uh, with my specialists who would come in. We would do a mild decluttering, that is for sure. But when I say mild, I mean some very minimal staging. I, I think that old the older couples, the older that they are, and they don't want to spend the money. I totally understand that because it will cost the money to do the staging and the updating. I would suggest we have to be very realistic then with the price. We have a conversation and we'll say, these are the scenarios. If we totally paint your home and do a whole number and stage it, this is what it could cost you. I'll give you an estimate. And this is the top value we can list your home for. If, however, you're not Welcome to doing that. I understand. Then I suggest we list your home as is, do a little bit of decluttering and getting your home ready for a minimal cost, but be realistic in the pricing. So the house is priced less than, of course, if it's fully staged and prepared at the higher level. Just for clarification purposes, when you say staging, what does that usually involve? So staging could be really three levels of staging. If a home is vacant, let's say a house would be 2,000 square feet. The stager would come in and they would put in furniture in all the rooms, mirrors, and 
all kinds of decor items, and the house would be completely staged. That would be the highest level of staging. You pay the stager for the selection of all the items, moving them all in for on a month-to-month basis. This would be the top level. Second level would be some partial staging. Let's say there's some sofas that in the home that are totally outdated, the colors, the floral. I don't know. Some people love that, but generally the public do, do not. It's more neutral. So maybe a stager who I would work with or anybody would work with would suggest, let's remove this sofa. Let's remove this very big, heavy armoire in the bedroom. Let's remove like 10% of what you have in the house. And they will bring in something a little softer, gentler, smaller, and there's storage fees involved. And in the third level, there would be do nothing. Let's just make your home look as best as we can and leave it at that. I'm curious to know because I remember, I can't remember if it was like 10 years ago or whatever, but flipping houses at some point was really popular. So to get your hands on a house that would need renovations like that would be a hot item to get your hands on. Now, has the market changed since then? The market locally is very strong, in particular with detached homes. People want space today. Of course, we've gone through the COVID year this year, and everyone has read that very, very hot aspect of the market are semi-detached townhomes and detached family homes that have gardens because people want exterior space, certainly in the six months of the summer. Very, very important. That is a hot market, and that continues throughout Canada. Certainly, I could speak to Toronto and GTA. Depending on the market, condos today, people are looking for balconies. Very important aspect because of outdoor space. So if one has a condo that they're selling with a balcony, it's superior to one that has no balcony. And are condos as popular as they may have been pre-COVID? I would say that there is an 8 to 10% from the stats that I have seen in the city core of Toronto drop in value this past year. And it's because young professionals are choosing not to move downtown or midtown Toronto as they once did before. They're not renting and they're not buying as as much as they did before. It has completely slowed down and it's due to COVID. It will definitely come back again, but because the offices are closed, a lot of them are closed down now due to COVID. They're not downtown as they were before. That is the entry level condo market. It has slowed down and there's an oversupply because investors are selling them more and more because of this. But what I want to say is the luxury market, those that are downsizing or the downsizer market, they're looking for more space, not the five or 600 square feet space that we're talking about with the condo market right now that we're talking about. It's the larger units that are very much in demand and they're not enough supply of that. Oh, is that right eh, for the boomers? The boomers, this is the problem I'm having with a lack of supply of the large units, 1800, 16 to 1800 to 2000 plus, plus square feet. That is a, in short supply because downsizers who have bought are not going to move. Yeah. And I'm curious to know when you're dealing with downsizing you were mentioning a lot about clearing out the clutter and stuff is it much like you know those movie or those shows that you see on like hdtv where somebody comes in helps them with the declutter and a lot actually goes to donation and trash so that when they're downsizing into their smaller living space they don't have to bring all that stuff with them melissa absolutely this is part of the role early on when we sit down with the family i bring in my transitional specialists we go over definitely let's make a list and let's strategize. First of all, what goes to the dumpster? What goes to the children and grandchildren? That is really important. Memories and heirlooms and fine silver and things like art. These are things that you discuss with your family. If the family then doesn't want them, then the next thing is if it's something valuable that you perceive to be worth money when you to sell, I would definitely recommend several auction houses. And I have had many clients clients who have sold major paintings that cannot be moved from a large home into a smaller condo space, and they go to auction. Otherwise, they go to a consignment store. And the last one would be donations, which is equally important.
And so you really have about six tiers of places that my transitional team together with me, certainly I oversee the real estate part, but they oversee the storage and the dispensing and the dispersing of all these items. So when you're dealing with the fear, when your clients have made the decision to sell, but they're still dealing with the fear of going through with the sale. How do you help and support them through that? The conversation that I have is to say, listen, I understand and I definitely am empathetic that and understand the emotional piece. That's so key to working with the boomer generation that I offer and most real estate professionals really don't. And I'm just saying that because it's extraordinarily important. I have downsized myself and I understand having sold a large uh, city, actually North York property in Toronto, uh, suburban area of Toronto with a pool and so on. And I went through that all that I have discussed in the book, I, I'm passionate about the topic because I understand it from within and in my core and all my friends are going through it and they're coming to me because because I understand the process. What do I do? In a way, metaphorically, I hold their hand and I say to them, tell me what's important to you. When we, if you sell your home and downsize, where would you like to move? That's a key point. Where are they going to move to? So I, we'd say, what is important to you? So some of them will tell me they will do what I did. They will sell their home because they really want to be downtown, city vibe, good walk score, don't need the car, enjoy food, restaurants, theater, nightlife, shopping, that kind of thing. And that's very important to a lot of the boomers. Right now, due to COVID, it's a little bit on pause. But within months, I know this will slowly revive as we can see this happening in the new year. So... They either would go to a condo or some of them say, we'll buy a little pied-a-terre, a small condo, but we want to buy a cottage. We want to spend more time perhaps at a, con- a beautiful country home or a farm commute or heritage towns. Not everyone wants a city condo when they downsize. Some of them want to be near children. Of course, they want to be near children or grandchildren. Some of them want the tranquility of a country property or a suburban larger or smaller home. Yes, that's true too. There's so many options out there. Now, in the transaction of the sale, how important is pricing? Pricing is extremely important. There are three levels of pricing I I talk about with the client. And I say, if we're going to maximize all the preparation of your home with staging and doing everything that we can to upgrade the appearance of your home, which could cost some money, 15000 or 20000 I'm just giving a general or less or more, to really invest in getting rid of the old broad loom, getting rid of the wallpaper, we would price the home to the top level of the area that the market can bear. Of course, we do a strategic study and I show them comparables and I show them the homes that have sold comparable to theirs most recently in their neighborhood. And I suggest to them a price now that they've done so much to prepare. This is what I think we can get. If they decide that they're not going to want to do everything. They're going to do perhaps just a little bit of refresh and a little bit of painting. They're not changing wallpaper and floors throughout. I would suggest a mid price. Let's go to this range because this is a comparable and we want your home to be sold quickly and not linger on the market too long because it gets stale and people think, oh, it's been on the market so long, something's wrong with the house. So we need to price it right accordingly. If they decide on the third tier, I can't do anything. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to spend money. I say to them, I think that we should suggest a lower range. And let's try this particular lower price point because I think it'll sell quickly. We do not want to overprice your home. That is a really big mistake. How often does that happen where people overprice their homes? Often. Sellers tend to think the value of their home is higher in many cases and they want top dollar no matter what. It's their home. They love their home. They prize their home and they have done some research and they think I can get X amount, the highest possible, and I have to bring them back down to earth. That's my role to say, listen, I think that uh, look at all the stats, the homes that are your size, your lot size, the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and so on. This has been renovated. So this is the price that they can get. Yours has not been renovated. I do not see how you could, how we can get you that price. We have to be realistic unless 
you want your home to sit on the market for a long time, that will bring your price and value down for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's the consequence of it being, as you said, stale, and it depreciates the value of the home. Absolutely. Pricing it right is really, really key. And the role of the real estate professional is marketing your home to as many places as possible, which would be my role, to have the best videos once the home is staged and prepared and so on. I, I, as the real estate professional, would be looking after the marketing of your home. So the best photography, the best video photography, the best digital exposure of your home, which is absolutely important. And my role is to get your house sold and to get it marketed to the widest audience possible. And then what other types of expenses typically come along with the sale of a home that that if you're considering on downsizing, you should budget for these type of expenses? Yes. So the expenses would be, of course, if you're staging, if you're decluttering, if you're planning, certainly the basic one would be lawyer's fees, of course, to close the deal, moving costs, legal costs, the costs also for the commission of the transaction. That is probably the biggest discussion we have when we price the house correctly. We discuss the listing process, the listing paperwork, and the fees involved. And the biggest fee involved is the commission. So that is a conversation you have right up front. In addition to all the other preparation expenses and the moving and legal expenses, the biggest one is the conversation about commission. So they need to know those numbers, which are discussed and negotiated on paper at the beginning. Excellent. And I'm curious too. So if I was thinking of selling my house and I was a boomer and I had to go through this whole process, how many months of lead time do you recommend to have before you actually want to have the house on the market? I think that's a really good question. It does depend on the state of the home. If a lot of work needs to be done, and of course I have at my um, disposal availability, contractors and so on, it depends. Things should be fixed as I mentioned in the book, they should be fixed inside and outside. So it depends. Getting a contractor takes a bit of time, renos or preparation and upkeep to, to make the home look better, as well as do interior and exterior repairs. This could take and decluttering, depending on how bad it is <laughs> and how much needs to be done. It could take a good one month at least to prepare the home. Sometimes to turn around quickly, it could be two weeks. We could say, listen, you don't have a lot to do. We're going to bring in our my team and we'll be ready within about two weeks. So two weeks to a month, I think, is once the decision is made, we can get it on the market. Okay, that's pretty quick. And then is springtime still the best time to list a home for sale? Springtime has always been the best time from, I would say, it's interesting, spring begins like mid-February, end of February, and certainly by March 1st till the end of June. That has typically always been the best time when the house, we're coming out of winter, the home is beginning to look really nice on the outside because of the grass is beginning to come up and, and snow is sort of as we move along. That is usually typically the best time. However, that's the time that's the most competition because everybody also says it's the best time. So everyone is putting out the, uh, their home at the same time. Due to COVID, and I mentioned this in the book, it's the best time is when the buyer comes to see your home and when the buyers, there are buyers out there all the time. So when the boomer or the family is ready to sell, that is the best time. And the idea about spring versus fall, it's gone by the wayside now. I'm very curious to know once a couple has made the transition. So you've guided them along the way and they've sold their house and now they're in their new condo or wherever it is that they chose to relocate to. What type of feedback do you generally get from your clients at this point? What I find from my clients, once they have made the decision, way back when we first met at the dining room table, we have alleviated all their fears because I have walked through with them the process. I've helped them with my team. And you can see them getting happier and happier along the way because their fears are being alleviated with the help that I'm providing through the real estate transaction, the emotional piece by having people come in to help them declutter, sort, get their home sold, get the right price and hopefully find them the right property to buy. Once they have moved, 
it's certainly a job to get the move happening. But once the move has taken place, they've purchased their new home or maybe decide to rent for a while or permanently. They are so happy because they've chosen to make this move and they have gone on with a lifestyle that makes them feel joyful and lighter in every way. I say this physically, emotionally in particular, lighter because they've made this decision. They have saved a lot of money because they've netted. The goal is also to net a lot of money in their pocket, which they wouldn't have had before for their retirement, which they can gift to their children. They can hopefully go back to traveling. They have a smaller space, be it a condo or otherwise, to upkeep less maintenance fees, less condo fees, less property fees. And they're always very grateful. I think they're grateful and relieved that they have made this choice. I want to add one other thing. Not everybody chooses to move and downsize by choice. There are circumstances in life where people meet with me and tell me they're going through a separation or divorce. They need to sell or they have lost their spouse. They need to sell or they are ill. They cannot handle the steps anymore. They have a physical disability or problem or emotional or loneliness or their elderly parents need to move and we need to help the family to sit down to help their elderly parents. So there are many scenarios, be it choice, choosing to do this or by circumstance and necessity and needing money for their retirement and their golden years. Some people need to sell for financial reasons. There are many reasons that are involved here and I am here to make it stress-free. That is my goal. Yes. Well, it sounds like you do a fantastic job of supporting your clients. I'm curious, how many years have you been in realty? I have been a real estate broker for about 10 years. I work full-time. I'm so passionate about what I do because I'm, I am so committed to helping those find ease in the moving process. And I'm here to expedite that for them. So it's 10 years full time of which 50% is the boomer market and the rest is everybody else who's buying and upsizing or selling. I really love what I do. And before that, I worked in a family property management business that we owned for 25 plus years before I became a full-time real estate broker specializing in this market. So you certainly have a lot of valuable experience. I have really enjoyed listening to you share your experience with us. If there was one big takeaway that you want listeners to walk away with today, what would you like listeners to walk away with? So the main takeaway I would say is once a couple has decided to make this move and to downsize, I think it's all about making the decision. And when people are indecisive, nothing happens. So my goal is to sit down with the family, to strategize with them. When I see their eyes light up and they're both on the same page and they're excited to make a change because they're ready for it, they are empty nesters now. It's very exciting to see that happen and to walk them along step by step through the emotional and transactional process and to see all the pieces fall together and how grateful. And I see this with my clients. Once we bring in help, meaning my my network of specialists that will help them throughout the entire process from A to Z to get the home ready, to get it staged if required, to get it sold and move to the next step and level of lifestyle that they want, that they have chosen. It's very exciting and gratifying for me because they're so grateful and happy and joyful that the their golden years, so to speak, as boomers and seniors is evolving to a life that they want and they've chosen. That's what my takeaway is. Make the decision. Let's be positive. Let's get rid of the fear now and let's make it happen. And that's what I love. Oh, I love hearing that. And I'm sure that your clients are so grateful when they work with you because you really sound like you've got that personal touch that, you know, so many of us need. It's such a highly emotional transaction. And I think your clients are super lucky to work with you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for coming on this show and sharing your expertise with us, Vivian. I appreciate this so much. My pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to the Think Like a CFO podcast with Melissa Houston, CPA. If you've enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. Your ratings and reviews help more people like you find our podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe and share this episode with someone you think would love it. Until next time, I'm Melissa Houston. And remember, nobody will ever care about your business as much as you do. So never give your financial power away.